Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for waiting. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome Special Representative for Venezuela, Elliot Abrams, to provide the latest updates on U.S. policy in Venezuela. His bio is in the briefing announcement. I assume you've all seen it. Just to clarify the ground rules, we are on the record. We will do some introductory remarks and then follow it up with a brief Q&A. With that, I'll turn it over to Special Representative Abrams. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I should begin by saying we welcome very much the return to Venezuela yesterday of interim President Juan Guaido <clears throat> safely. Um, and as you know, that was a concern of the international community. Interesting to note what he has done today on his first day back, which is to meet with labor leaders from a variety of unions, mostly public employee unions, talking to them about uh, their role today while the Maduro regime is still there and in the future when there is a democratic Venezuela. U.S. policy is um, unchanged. <clears throat> it is to support democracy in Venezuela, to support the National Assembly, which is the only democratically elected part of the government, and to support uh, the interim president, uh, who was the leader of the National Assembly, uh, Juan Guaido. Uh, we are <coughs> placing uh, significant pressure, along with other members of the international community, on the Maduro regime. As you know, there are 54 countries that recognize Juan Guaido as the legitimate interim president of Venezuela. Um, our pressure is put on in uh, numerous ways. Uh, economic pressure, such as the sanctioning of PDVSA, the oil company. The pressure we've put on members of the regime through sanctions on named individuals. Uh, that comes from Treasury, and uh, that will no doubt continue. The revocation of visas. I uh, announced last week the revocation of, of 59 uh, for, that is to say, for Venezuelans who have visas for the United States and whose visas have been canceled. There will be more of those, so stay tuned for further announcements of visa cancellations and revocations. We are urging all Venezuelans to support interim President Guaido uh, and the return of Venezuela to democracy. We are particularly uh, supporting his outreach to members of the military and members of the Chavista party. Uh, the military will have an important role in the future of Venezuela. We have seen the regime, for example, uh, on the Colombian border on February 23rd, use gangs, armed gangs, colectivos, uh, in place of the military. There will be no stability and rule of law in Venezuela in the future if armed gangs replace uh, the military as an institution. That is something that um, we are arguing to the Venezuelan military. It's time for them uh, to stand up for the Venezuelan constitution, for the rule of law, and against these kinds of armed gangs that are being built and promoted and expanded by the Maduro regime. And as to the outreach to Chavistas, uh, our position is that all political parties have a role to play in the future of Venezuela in a democratic election. And the people of Venezuela will decide uh, how much power to allocate to each of those parties. Uh, but they all have a role to play. And in saying that, we are merely echoing what the National Assembly and Juan Guaido uh, have said. Uh, that's enough of an intro, so I'd be happy to take questions now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me just remind folks of uh, FPC House rules. Please wait for a microphone. Please identify yourself by name and outlet. And then please, one question only. We have a lot of people in the room who are going to want to ask questions. So let me start with Luis. Hi, thank you. I'm Luis Alonso with the AP. Uh, Mr. Abrams, I, I would like to ask you about um, a potential scenario where Maduro runs as a candidate uh, for president in, in new elections. Is the U.S. open to that scenario, or is a complete no? 
it would um, it would be a gift in a way because according to the most recent polls I've seen, he's at about 10 or 15 percent support. Um, that's ultimately a decision for Venezuelans to make, but uh, it's very hard, I would say, for me to see how a dictator such as Maduro, who has committed so many crimes against the people of Venezuela, who is so deeply responsible for the human rights violations, for the decline in Venezuela's economic situation, um, can really have a role to play in the building of a democratic Venezuela. If he wanted to build a democratic Venezuela, he had the opportunity to do so, but he did not. Um, so, you know, we'll, we will leave such decisions to Venezuelans in every democratic transition in Latin America. Uh, there are negotiations. Uh, but I would just say it's, it's, um, it's extremely difficult to see how he could play a positive role in, in, um, in a democratic election. He certainly didn't in May of last year. I'll take one more here and then I'll go to New York. Uh, sir, I'll take you. Thank you very much, sir. Emiliano Bos from the Swiss Public Radio. Um, Vice President uh, Pan said that any threats, violence, or intimidation against Mr. Guaido uh, will not be tolerated and will be met with swift response. Can you confirm or deny if the U.S. has already some plans ready in case of this Swiss swift response is needed and if there's any plan already prepared for using a military force? Thank you. Well, we have lots of um, plans. Um, we have lots of um, steps that we can take that will affect, uh, for example, the economy, uh, the financial system, uh, that will affect members of the regime. Uh, steps along the lines that we have taken in the past, but tougher. Uh, and, and we've discussed them internally, and they are, they're ready if we need to use them uh, against the regime. Um, nobody's talking about uh, American military steps except uh, the regime and the Russians, actually. Um, I made it clear repeatedly, our policy is, as I just stated, diplomatic, political, economic, financial pressure moving toward a peaceful democratic transition in Venezuela. That's what we want. Uh, that's what our policy is determined uh, to achieve. The president always says all options are on the table um, because all options always are on the table, and that's true in this case as well. But that is not the path that we choose to go down. Thank you. We'll go to New York, please. Go to New York, please. Hi. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, James Reinald with uh, Middle East. Hi, thanks so much for the briefing. Earlier on in the crisis, Mike Pompeo referred to Hezbollah activity in Venezuela. And of course, there is a long history, a track record of Hezbollah activity over there. It's been documented in US court cases and uh, uh, the Treasury, for example. But is there anything that you've seen in the past few weeks in Venezuela that indicates Hezbollah is, in, is active in some way in Venezuela, um, perhaps with training of colectivos or financial transactions that show that the group is in some way trying to maintain the, the Maduro regime? Well, I cannot get into intelligence reporting. Um, and I can't even say whether it exists or doesn't exist. Uh, but there are a lot of very bad actors in Venezuela. Um, there are people from Hezbollah. There are also ELN and FARC guerrillas uh, near the Colombian border, uh, in addition to there being many, many thousands of Cuban security uh, people. Uh, so there, there are a lot of people um, who qualify for um, either the term, the general term, bad actor, or the term terrorist. Uh, but further than that, I don't really want to go here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take here and here, please. So, sir, you go first. Thank you. Jafar Jafri with al Mayadeen Network. Um, you really answered part of my question that I was going to ask you, and that okay, is... Okay, next. Uh, <laughs> And that is the U.S. has always kept its options open, and it's been uh, debated that includes the military option. 
Now, will that military option be used in Venezuela via uh, special ops? And will Turkey be asked to join the special operations in Venezuela? Um, I'm not going to go further than saying that, as the President has repeatedly said, all options are on the table. To go further than that is to engage in speculation about hypotheticals, and I'm not going to do it. Here, and then we'll go to New York. Hi, thank you. Beatriz Pascual with EFE. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned economic pressure. I was wondering when the representatives of Juan Guaido will have access to CITCO assets. To? To CITCO. CITCO. Um, interim President Guaido has appointed a new board uh, for CITCO. Um, and um, it's kind of a rolling um, decision-making process as they get, when they get access to various accounts. For example, there are Venezuelan government accounts in the U.S., which we will give them control over. There are other international accounts. There are CITCO accounts. Um, in some cases, and the question of CITCO and PDVSA is going to keep thousands of lawyers happily employed for months. So I don't, I'm really not able to get into the details of when will uh, they decide or when will the board decide that this, this asset is PDVSA, this asset is CITCO, this asset can be given uh, to, con to new control now. It's complicated. But uh, the process is moving forward. Okay, we'll go to New York and then we'll take a couple back here. Paolo Mastrorilli with the Italian Daily newspaper La Stampa. Uh, thank you very much for the briefing. Two questions. The first is about Italy. It's uh, one of the few European countries that have not yet recognized Guaido, even though th there is a huge Italian community in Venezuela. What is your message to the Italian government? The second is about the OEC, which has not recognized Guaido as well. What role can the Vatican play in order to uh, favor uh, a democratic transition in the country? Well, we're disappointed that Italy uh, has not joined, I think it's 24 of the 28 EU countries in recognizing uh, Juan Guaido as the interim president. <clears throat> and we hope that uh, the continuing argument in Italy, the continuing discussions in Italy will lead at some point uh, to what we would view as a better decision joining so many of Italy's uh, partners in Europe. We think that's the right decision to make. Uh, the Vatican is in a slightly different situation. Um, it has different interests in Venezuela. It has a different role, of course, in Venezuela and elsewhere. Um, we have um, had some contacts with the Vatican, um, and perhaps over time they will have a larger uh, role to play. We're going to take one right here and then in the back. Hi, Carolina from NTN24. Uh, you have repeatedly uh, said about the sanctions against the uh, people in the government of uh, Maduro, but I was willing to know if you're thinking, the U.S. government, of sanctioning individuals, companies, or other governments that will engage in business with companies dependent on the Maduro's regime or government. Well, we haven't done that yet, secondary sanctions. Um, it's clearly a possibility. It would depend on the conduct of the regime over time. Um, it would depend on the conduct of those um, entities, many of which I, I would say are backing away a bit from uh, the Maduro regime. Um, but uh, that, that's a decision that uh, we have not yet made. Uh, it's always a possibility, but we're not there yet. Sir, in the back, you might need to step away from your camera so we don't get feedback off your mic. Thank you. Jorge Agobian from Voice of America. The first question that I have is um, there are people who are questioning about the impact that the sanctions has uh, have on the people of Venezuela. Um, how, how are you exploring if these sanctions are impacting on the people? And all the, the, other, qu the qu other question is, if um, are you planning to have another way to get the humanitarian aid into the country? You know, I've heard the argument before that the sanctions are 
having a uh, big humanitarian impact. I don't think it makes sense. Uh, look at the condition of this economy in Venezuela. Last year they had a million percent inflation. This is before we did anything, for example, on PDVSA. A million percent inflation. It has been estimated by some people at the IMF that it will be 10 million percent this year, which is to say that the currency is worth nothing. Uh, this regime has a long record now of destroying the economy of Venezuela. How? Through mismanagement, through vast corruption, through theft of the uh, assets that belong to the Venezuelan people. You know, we have found in various places over the last few years uh, gigantic accounts of regime insiders uh, who have stolen large amounts of money. Um, none of this has anything to do with American sanctions. It's been going on for a very long time. Uh, and as for the new sanctions, well, you know, they not only have they just been put in place, but in some cases we gave people 90 or 180 day grace periods to adjust. So in some cases they haven't even been put in place. Um, at the same time, of course, we are, we are trying to affect the regime, not the people of Venezuela, which is why we have spent a couple of hundred million dollars on, first of all, aid to Venezuelans who have had to flee their country and who are outside in Colombia and elsewhere. Um, and we have staged humanitarian aid on the borders and continue to do that, by the way. That process is not over. We are still having these flights, um, mostly staging at Cucuta, but also in other places, um, in an effort to get aid in to the people of Venezuela. You know, we... Um, the PDVSA sanctions, for example, uh, PDVSA was getting no cash from Russia and China for its oil. It was shipping oil and it was payment for, PV for debts that existed. The cash was coming from the United States and that cash has now been uh, cut off. Now, in February, so think for a minute, what was the condition of the economy in February? What was the condition of the economy last year? All of these things preceded. They are the product of the corruption and inefficiency and mismanagement of this regime, not of American sanctions. Let's take New York, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ibtisam Azam from the Daily Arabic Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one, uh, to which extent you are concerned that the course you took against the Maduro uh, regime is not harvesting the results you wanted, given the fact that not so many uh, military personnel uh, defected or went against uh, the Maduro regime. Also, uh, the number of countries that, uh, um, uh, um, like, um, accepted, the, um, declared their, um, um, uh, that they um, accept the Gnaido uh, are only for 54 countries, given the fact that more than 130 countries are still uh, on the side of the Maduro. And the second question regarding the uh, foreign minister of uh, the Maduro government, uh, he was uh, in New York, he gave a press, more than one press conference uh, and talked about the fact that he has a context to the U.S. government. Can you put us more on uh, this issue in the picture and say more about it? Thank you so much. Sure. Um, if you think of the, the situation in Venezuela, let us say last year, and compare it to now. Just think about that for a minute. Last year you have a divided opposition which really doesn't have a leader and a way forward. Now, three months later, you have 54 countries, many of them in Europe, in Latin America, Canada and the United States, acknowledging as a legitimate leader the interim president, Juan Guaido, the leader of the National Assembly, and you have the entire opposition united behind him. That's an amazing change in just a few months. Uh, I think it, so I, I would say the, the first, um, 
the policy of the Venezuelans uh, to move from being in opposition to having an interim president who is leader of the National Assembly is a very important uh, change. Their unity is a very important change. The support of so many countries around the world for that movement, for the National Assembly and Guaido, is a very important change. Now, in terms of you know military defectors, um, there are hundreds of defectors, except I wouldn't use that word. If you are a military officer and you decide, I am finished with this illegitimate and corrupt regime, I want to support the Constitution and the National Assembly and Guaido, you are not a defector. You are a loyal Venezuelan. You are a patriot. Um, my experience with regimes, not only in Latin America, but really all around the world, is we don't have much skill at predicting when they're going to fall. Uh, I remember the uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Russia, 1991. I don't remember people saying, by the way, I'll give you the date. It's three weeks. They're finished. These regimes all look very stable until the day that they fall, which is very often a, a considerable surprise. So I'm not um, concerned about that at all. I think that that um, uh, the, the change in the last few months in the situation in Venezuela, the internal political situation, is remarkable. About um, uh, Ariasa, after the first Security Council meeting, which was, I think, January 25th, I met immediately with uh, the representatives of uh, interim President Guaido. Uh, there was then a meeting with Ariasa. Uh, we have met twice. Um, why? Well, as I've explained before, we have an embassy in Caracas. So we have had discussions about uh, the conditions under which that uh, embassy exists and is able to uh, continue to do its work. We have lots of, the number is really unclear because we have no way of tracking it, but we have certainly thousands and thousands of American citizens in uh, Venezuela. We have prisoners in uh, 12, I think, in Venezuelan jails. Um, so, and we have the embassy staff itself. So we have reason to be concerned about all of that. And that is what we've talked about. We have time for one more. This gentleman's been waiting. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Rafolo from Trial News Agency. Ambassador, 54 is an incredible number, but when you look at the broader picture, there are 130 other countries. How would you characterize them? Are they like Maduro supporters or do they remain impartial? Do we only reach out to Maduro's adversaries or his friends too? And my particular question is about South Cauc Caucasian countries, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Ambassador Bolton recently, recently spoke with all three contest leaders and only appreciated the Georgian president you know, for supporting Maduro's <coughs> opponents. Do you have any opinion about Azerbaijan and Armenia? Are they Mad flirting with Maduro's? Thank you very much. Um, my impression is that there are just a very few countries that you could say support Maduro. Um, Russia, China, uh, although they are not in exactly the same situation, but they did vote together against the U.S. resolution in the Security Council. Uh, uh, Cuba, uh, clearly, which has lived off Venezuela. It's really quite striking if you think about it. Venezuelans are suffering enormously from the lack of food and medicine and giving hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil a day freely um, to Cuba and Nicaragua. Um, which is to say there is no democracy supporting Maduro. Um, the other countries I would characterize really as um, having different reasons for not taking a position. Uh, some are worried about debts that they owe to the regime. Some are worried about their citizens in uh, Venezuela and concerned that um, uh, the government there might, uh, not the government, the regime, might turn against them or that if their embassy were closed, they wouldn't be able to provide consular services. Um, I don't think any of it represents any particular enthusiasm for or endorsement of the Maduro regime. Can I take one more? Sure. 
take AFP right here, please. Yeah. Uh, Adil wait, wait for a mic, please. Thanks. Adila Navarro from AFP. Is the U.S. government working for a TPS for Venezuelan citizens? Um, there are a lot of Venezuelan citizens in the United States. We are aware of that. Um, and whenever I go up to testify in Congress, the question is posed, particularly, of course, by people who represent uh, Florida, because uh, that's the place where the most uh, Venezuelans are. Um, all I can say, we have no U.S. government decision. All I can say is um, we're aware of the problem. We are consistently made aware of this issue by uh, representatives and senators from Florida. So it is on the agenda, and it's something that we are going to um, uh, deal with and make some decisions about uh, in the near future, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Special Representative Abrams, for coming today.